All right. Let's get started. That was my snack break. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Mark Mahaney at uh, uh, RBC. Shweta Kajari and I are, are co-hosting uh, Seattle uh, Steve Loudon, or Steve Seattle Loudon, the CFO of um, Roku for the next 30 minutes. If you have any questions you want us to ask or you want to ask, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Please feel free to type in questions. As the days gone by, we've gotten more and more people use that functionality, so and we have been asking those uh, questions. Steve, thanks a ton for joining us. I know we only got 30 minutes. This is glibly and maybe overly glibly put the vaccine conference. First time that many companies, investors, are looking at companies post what looks like very promising vaccine news and, a, and hopefully a return to normalcy. Um, do you expect that to have any major impact on your business, which is another way of asking, do you think that the COVID crisis served as a, had any permanent um, impacts or semi-permanent impacts on Roku's business that will be reversed as we go into, uh, you know, the back to normalcy? Yeah. Hey, Mark. And uh, thanks to you and Sweater for hosting us here. This is always a great conference. And so the virtual incarnation will be, uh, will be interesting. Uh yeah, when I when I look at uh, the world, you know, you get back to the fundamental premise of Roku that all TV will be streamed, and the corollary to that is that all TV advertising will be streamed. And so the COVID impacts for us have been largely an accelerant of uh, that trend toward that end state. And so certainly there have been some puts and takes, but Roku's been relatively fortunate in terms of accelerated interest in um, both – streaming players, TVs, that's resulted in accelerating active account growth um, for Roku over the last couple of quarters. Um, and then certainly there's been some puts and takes on the advertising, but, uh, you know, we see that the COVID impacts have been disrupting a lot of the traditional industry structures around um, advertising upfronts um, or the theatrical windowing. And so those are all positive factors. I don't think that, um, you know, uh, that when the COVID crisis subsides, um, hopefully sooner rather than later with the, the uh, prospect of these vaccines, that it's going to change anything because we do believe that long-term trend um, is, is, you know, still, still intact, but rather um, we're just still getting there faster than we probably would have otherwise. But I feel good about the, the trajectory of the business, the resilience of it, um, um, you know, regardless of, of whether we were in a COVID crisis or not, um, because people are voting with moving to streaming. And our research suggests that uh, they're very happy once they move over to streaming. So they're, they're not going back to the old world and paying more for a cable bundle, regardless of whether we're out of the woods on COVID or not. And Steve, do you think that um, uh, the COVID crisis on the advertiser side Helped create kind of a, a tipping point. And we've had um, uh, quite a long period of time here in which um, linear TV campaigns may have been uh, uh, upset, upended. Uh, live uh, sports did come back live, but really crowd for a lot of people. That wasn't the people prefer watch crowds watching uh, uh, sports rather than watching sports. Uh, so, uh, uh, do you think that there's evidence that there really wasn't an inflection in just uh, TV ad budgets uh, migrating online too? Yeah, I think um, I think the disruption related to COVID has been um, a positive factor for the move to streaming. Um, folks that may have heard me talk before, I've, I've talked about the phenomenon um, pre-COVID many times that the viewership has been moving over to streaming at increasing rates, um, but the ad budgets have been lagging significantly. And I think a lot of that has to do with the inertia of the traditional TV upfront process where the, the you know, networks have done, a, have done a, uh, a fine job of trying to you know, entice uh, TV advertisers to spend a little more in the upfront process for next year based on some perceived scarcity while at the same time over the last five years, you know, TV ratings have gone down by about half. Um, but I think what, what you found is that when advertisers were very concerned, especially early in the, the pandemic impacts around the amount of ad budget that they were spending and needing to curtail that, they looked a lot harder at the fact that under the traditional upfront process, they were spending 
vast majority of their TV budgets um, six to 12 months out, um, and they did not have flexibility. And so what you've seen is that uh, process be disruptive in part because of lack of content here in the fall because of production stuff, but also because advertisers increasingly are pushing back on having that level of commitments. At the same time, their prior year upfront deals, um, they've exercised a little use clause historically to be able to give notice and back out of significant portions of that prior commitment. And with that, we have seen them, you know, mix shift into OTT and into Roku in particular, because that's where the viewership is going, but it's also a, uh, more targeted, uh, more measurable, uh, piece of advertising. And now that there's more scrutiny on budgets, you know, having, um, a much better sense of the ROI of your marketing is very, uh, very appealing to marketers. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Shweta? Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, so in the third quarter, Roku monetized ad impressions grew 90%. So I guess two questions are, how sustainable is this? And is it a decent proxy for um, ad video ad revenue growth? Yeah, thanks, for that. Um, yeah, if you if if you kind of uh, look back at the trend on Roku monetized video ad impressions, we do believe that that's our best directional indicator of how the ad business is doing. Um, before COVID, for I think it was six or seven quarters in a row, we talked about that Roku monetized video ad impressions was growing at uh, you know a hundred plus percent. Um, in Q2, you saw that decrease to 50% year over year um, as a lot of these marketers reflexively um, pulled the emergency break on, on a chunk of their ad spend. And then it bounced back in Q3 to 90% year over year. So it, it, it's up significantly on, you know, relative uh, between Q2 and Q3 year over year growth rates, but it's not quite back to the pace that it was growing pre-COVID. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm encouraged that it's bouncing back, but um, you know, I, it's not, not really quite back to normal, although certainly we do, we do believe that we're outpacing the market significantly, um, as, as folks lean into Roku. Um, in, in terms of, you know, what's, what's the proxy? I, you know, I think we're, we continue to be a premium CPM, uh, ad buy, but it, you know, that's more than justified given the, the better ROI for that. So, you know, we largely focus on moving advertising budgets over from traditional TV to Roku, um, and that's by far the biggest lever we can in terms of driving future growth and, and penetrating a, a massive opportunity as this $70 billion in the U.S. alone of TV advertising follows viewership to streaming. You know, just one thing on that, just to give you a comparison point, um, you know, there's a pretty incredible stat, um, I think it's from Nielsen, where for 18 to 34 four year olds, a key demo, um, you know, roughly half of their TV viewing in the quarter was streaming versus you look at the advertising budgets and market data is a little harder to come by there, but you, you probably are in the mid single digit range for the, the percent of advertising budgets that have shipped over, shipped over. So even the fact that, you know, people are leaning more into OTT advertising and Roku in particular, there's still a massive gap where they, they greatly trail the amount of viewership that's moved over. And we think they need to, to right-size that over time. Okay. Thanks, Steve. And then uh, in the third quarter, there was also this one-time impact of revaluation of the business contracts, uh, which if you want to quantify here, that would be great. But if not, should we expect that? Uh, is that on an ongoing basis? Yeah, we didn't quantify it in particular, but we did say that, you know, the primary driver of the strength in the platform business was, was just the kind of core uh, bounce back of the advertising business relative to Q2, as well as, um, you know, very strong fundamentals in the uh, content distribution side of the business. And then in addition, you had this, uh, the fact that a lot of these 606 content distribution deal models were, were revalued up. As a reminder, we, we value these deals, not just content distribution deals, but all our material deals under 606 accounting every quarter, and we have a portfolio of these deals. Some go up in a quarter, some go down, a lot stay the same. Really, you get a spike uh, like we experienced in Q3 when there's a usually a common set of assumptions that 
changed, uh, you know, several deal models um, in one direction. And in our case, it was it was having a couple quarters worth of uh, post COVID related experience where we see accelerating active account base. We see higher propensity of consumers on SPOD uh, subscriptions. You know, TVOD has has made a resurgence as you know, especially the premium premium movie rental um, has has become a bigger bigger thing, and so that caused us to value the deal deal models up, um, and you get an outsized portion of that in the quarter you do that. Um, in terms of you know, just for historical reference, the last time we had a, a similar kind of uh, outsized impact of the six six oh six deal model. Uh, valuation exercise that we do each quarter was back in Q2 of 19. So it does happen, um, not that often. We did mention in some color for Q4 that we didn't expect uh, expect that you know to have a similar impact in Q4 uh, uh, this year. Okay, thanks, Steve. Mark. Sure. Let me ask you two questions, Steve. One on OEM relations and one on international market expansion. Relations. Would you uh, spend a little time riffing on what the status of Roku is like with OEM today, uh, and, and uh, uh, both in the U.S. and in Europe? Yeah, so, hey, Mark, you're, you're breaking up a little there, but I think the question was around uh, OEM relationships um, in sort of U.S. and international. Um, yeah, in terms of the Roku Steve, TV program there? in general, in terms of the Roku TV program in general, uh, things have been going very well. As a reminder, we started that program about five years ago, and so we've gone from no market share um, while at the time, you know, uh, Android TV was already out there licensing, uh, uh, you know, an operating system. So no market share five years ago to over a third of smart TVs uh, that are sold running the Roku OS um, in the U.S. So we're number one. We passed Samsung as the top operating system in the U.S. Um, within this last year. Um, we announced uh, in this quarter that we're, we believe we're now number one in Canada as well in terms of smart TV OS sales. Um, so very good progress on that. Um, you know, we continue to uh, have a strategy where, you know, we want to become the default TV operating system. Uh, and we're, you know, we, we have a multi OEM strategy, non-exclusive strategy, and we've been continuing to add OEMs in the U.S. and we've added a lot more uh, OEMs internationally as well, and then we're we're kind of building out uh, the offering for Roku TV elsewhere. Yeah, certainly TCL has been our historically uh, biggest partner. Um, they were, you know, kudos to them uh, for the U.S. team. They they went all in on Roku from day one, and that we we helped them go from you know twenty something in the market to to you know one of the top players. Um, but we've also seen in the U.S. you know really strong growth over the last year. With other partners as well, including Hisense, who's really leaned in to Roku um, over the last year or two. Also, notably, uh, Walmart's on brand, um, so their house brand of TVs. Um, you know, it's co-branded uh, Ron on Roku TV, and they've gained significant share in the market. Um, so we've been leaning in heavily with Walmart, and then we're happy to see that we were able to extend the the TCL deal, deal internationally. We haven't. Um, access or we haven't announced any of those specific markets because they'll, they'll start coming in 2021. Um, but I think that speaks to being able to expand the relationship elsewhere. Um, but at the same time, we're, we've been growing internationally with other OEMs. You know, in the last year, we've launched Roku TVs in uh, Brazil and the UK. We've been gaining a lot of share to not only in Canada, but also in Mexico. Um, so that speaks very well to the value proposition of the Roku program and the momentum we have. Mark, are you on mute? Yeah, I'm having uh, having a hard time. Uh... 
I can't you don't have any key, uh, uh, OEM relationships internationally. You just got an umbrella agreement, and next year we'll see an announcement of specific country markets. Yeah, that's correct. So the the development cycle on on those TV programs are generally let's call them six to nine, maybe twelve months. And so we we signed the deal, um, you know, kind of mid to fall here this year. Um, and so that means development cycles will, the TVs will start coming out in 2021 on, under that agreement. Let me, uh, let's see, let me follow up on that. Uh, it's hard to hear, Mark. So let me follow up. Um, what percent share does Roku have of smart TV, uh, smart TVs and players outside the U.S.? So if we think about Europe right now, and uh, who who else uh, is a is a leader there? Yeah, in terms of international, it's uh, you know it depends on the market, but uh, you know as a reminder, our our international go to market is three phase, right? We need to build scale. We need to drive uh, engagement and then monetize. So a lot of these markets were pretty early, and so we are we are still focused on building scale. Ideally, we want to get players and TVs into, into markets we're in to have a critical mass of the value prop um, and, and get, you know, maximize our reach as quick as we can. Um, so it really depends. Like I said, Canada, we're, we're a leading platform, uh, streaming platform. We're number one in TVs. Um, we're, we're growing fast players, both U.S., or sorry, both Canada and UK more than doubled last year. I don't have the specific market shares, but but certainly um, you know there are other players, you know, notably Google and Amazon that have international footprints. But importantly, we we um, are hardened by the fact that the playbook that I described as three phase playbook and the competitive differentiators that we have in the U.S. have we've got good proof points that that has significant traction in other markets as well. Um, you know, so. The fact that we have lower bomb costs, right, that means we can build cheaper players and TVs and have an advantage over our competitors there. Our neutral positioning, the fact that we're free ad-supported TV experts is more important in, in the rest of the world where they don't come to streaming with a high pay TV, high monthly bill penetration um, that the U.S. does. So, um, you know, we're, we think the international market still, you know, the fact that they're, they're significantly behind the U.S. in a lot of countries uh, makes it an open playing field, and a lot of our advantages work nicely um, in other markets, and we, we're seeing good proof points of that. Okay. Um, let me follow up with Mark. Are you back, back on? Go ahead, Shweta. You okay, ask the next question. Go ahead, Shweta. You ask the next question. Back in. Okay, that sounds good. Let me ask you another question that came in from um, investors here. Here in smart TV, so incentives would consumers have to buy a Roku smart product once smart TVs have fully penetrated? Or in other words, how differentiated is Roku from others in the market, and how will consumers identify that difference, and why would they choose over a different smart TV? Yeah, so I mean, it's. Um... I think that, you know, the key of why you would choose the Roku TV, it, first and foremost, is um, it's a better value TV. And most importantly, the operating system is superior in terms of the UI is simple to use. We have, uh, you know, we historically had the most content. Um, and the fact is, if you think about not just us saying that we're, you know, that we're a better mousetrap, but the fact is, you know, on the player side, um, you know, I think we've now won CNET Editor's Choice Awards in nine years in a row in the streaming category. Um, our TVs are, you know, are usually getting the top ratings as well, both from uh, professional reviewers and strong consumer reviews. And so that just speaks to that it's easy to use. The TVs are good value because we can help our OEMs build them cheap, more cheaply. Um, and so there's a lot of advantages uh, to that from a consumer stand standpoint. Certainly as the Roku TVs grow um, and we become, you know, a default home screen on more and more TVs, you know, uh, potentially the, the player opportunity, you know, can wane over time. But I, I think there's a lot more legs in players. Um, if you look at the latest trends, there's uh, a lot of unconnected TVs out there. There's a lot of smart TVs that out there that don't have great OSs. 
um, from other players. And so it's an easy thing to add a Roku player to a TV to upgrade the OS, and a lot of people do. Oh, that makes sense. Let me uh, let me switch gears to the Roku channel. Um, so how do you view the opportunity with the Roku channel in terms of engagement and in terms of monetization? So let's start with engagement first. You've uh, mentioned in the third quarter, right now you're reaching people or households that have 54 million people or so with the Roku channel. What does this mean in terms of the account ads that you can get or streaming hours? And then I'll follow up with monetization. Yeah, so uh, yeah, good question. If you if you go back to our, our business model or our, our uh, you know kind of drive scale, drive engagement, and then monetize, the Roku channel does a very nice job of driving engagement and then also I I enhancing Roku's monetization. So uh, you know on the engagement side, we started the Roku channel about three years ago. We correctly identified that free ad supported content was an important part of many consumers streaming viewing habits because they're, they're, a lot of folks are willing to trade off, you know, getting free TV versus subscri subscription TV as long as the ad, uh, ad load and ad experience is not too painful. And so that's really the premise we started the Roku channel. We were well ahead of the industry on that. And, and certainly, uh, you know, that the Roku channel has been growing uh, very rapidly, you know, since its inception. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the reach now that we're over 50 households with over 50 million people in them um, in reach. That's very significant reach, but just as importantly, you know, some other stats from Roku channel, just to show the, the pace of growth, it, it more than doubled its reach on a year over year basis. It more than doubled its streaming hours year over year. It was the fastest growing app of the top 10 apps, um, by streaming hour growth. Um, so it's just, it's becoming this, you know, more compelling aggregation point for a lot of content, especially free ad supported content. It's a great consumer experience. And then from a monetization side, um, it's, you know, one of the advantages that as a platform owner is structurally, we, we know who's watching. We have a first party consumer relationship with the folks because they've signed into their Roku account. If you're a standalone AVOD app, you don't know who's watching. A lot of people don't realize that but you, you kind of have about as much data as you do in the traditional linear world if you're a standalone AVOD app because you don't have any kind of authentication on the front end of your AVOD app. Otherwise, that would kill a lot of your traffic. Um, but we know who's watching um, in the in the Roku channel. And then we have a, the, uh, you know, the best proprietary data set on the platform. And so because we know who's watching and we have good uh, data, we can have better content recommend recommendation algorithms, hence that drives engagement and just as importantly, on the monetization side, we can now sell that uh, that view of a library piece of content for a premium targeted CPM, as opposed to a standalone Abot app that has to sell that on a run a network or a lightly targeted Nielsen demo at a much lower CPM. So that gives us a very strong advantage. And over time, that flywheel, I think, is really um, is really you know enhancing the Roku channel growth, along with the fact that we're continuing to innovate in the Roku channel. You know, we added an electronic programming guide. We added a lot of linear uh, live channels, um, which was great. You know, as you got into election season, we've added new categories like kids and family over time. Um, premium subscriptions, which is our SBOT service or offerings within the Roku channel. We just keep putting more and more uh, content and, and experiences in, into the Roku channel, which helps fuel growth as well. Okay. I'm going to try one more and then spin it over to you, Mark. Mark, are you? can you hear and... Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let me follow up on Roku channel monetization. So you've referred to monetization as being denser on the Roku channel. So when you compare monetization on Roku within the Roku channel and outside of the Roku channel where you have a different level of control of different percentage of inventory, how? what do you mean by that? What do you mean that it is denser? And can you compare the two, please? Sure. Yeah. So what I mean by that is if you, if, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, any, any streaming hour of Roku, you can have some hours that are, are more or less dense. Um, you know, right now, because we're early days still in the move to streaming, you know, we're focused on getting, you know, more active accounts, more scale and just more general engagement. And then the monetization, you know, we're, we're still early days. So we're not too particular. Like we just want the broader to format the broader trend. But when you look at within those streaming hours, you know, if you've, uh, 
if you got someone that, um, you know, say is an existing Netflix subscription that we didn't sign up then, and they spend more of their time in there, that's less dense monetization. Although we do, we do monetize every user, whether it's from display ads or buttons on the remotes or, or other sponsorships or other things in there. But if you think about then AVOD, you know, if it's a third party app, we get, uh, you know, the general models, we get a share of inventory, but the content owner is always going to have the majority of that inventory. Versus in the Roku channel, we have uh, we control 100% of the ad inventory, and then we uh, we're able to you know we have a rev share agreement, but then that means that we have a denser amount of monetization than we would necessarily getting some inventory split from a third party app. And so that's why I talk about sort of these levels of density. So all things being equal, uh, you know the Roku channel growing faster than average. Uh, you know, helps to be uh, a, a, a tailwind for the fact that uh, Roku monetized video ad impressions would grow faster than the overall streaming hours. Understood. That makes sense. So a greater potential for higher gross profit dollars uh, on the Roku channel than outside of Roku channel, uh, margins being the same, gross margins being the same. Yep. Uh, okay. Mark, I'm going to spin it to you. Yep. Uh, hopefully you can hear me this time. Um, uh, Amazon yeah. and HBO Max reached a deal yesterday. How close is Roku to striking a deal with HBO Max? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have any specific update on that. We generally don't talk about where we're at in deals. Um, but, yeah, we, we continue to talk to, to uh, folks. And, uh, you know, our goal is to have all content on there. Um, but similar to the Peacock situation, we're not always first. Um, but we've got a very good idea about what market is and how much value we can create. Um, we've got the, you know, biggest, most engaged user base in the, in the U.S. And so, um, hopefully we can get, get a deal done and then we can use our industry leading audience development tools to help build audience for, for new services. Do you plan to open up more and more of your ad inventory to outside uh, demand side, uh, platforms, uh, like, uh, the trade desk? Well, for, for our Roku media, we, we sell that direct either through our direct sales force or through the OneView platform. So we, do, we don't use um, outside parties as a demand source uh, for us in terms of putting our uh, uh, inventory, say, in a third-party DSP auction or marketplace. Um, we, we do have connections to third-party DSPs as well as other players in the ecosystem, whether it's SSPs or, or measurement partners. And usually how that works is uh, advertiser advertisers or their agencies would come to us and they would purchase Roku inventory and they'd say they would like to fulfill some of that via a third-party DSP or some other other instance and then so we have connections to that to facilitate that. But the you know we're we're focused on selling our our uh, inventory ourselves for the most part. Could you talk about the degree of concentration in uh, Roku uh, platform uh, streaming hours? At the time of the IPO, it was a pretty substantial concentration towards uh, Netflix, Amazon, YouTube. Over the last two or three years, has that concentration uh, held constant, decreased, or increased? Yeah, in terms of um, you know some of the things that we've noted publicly in our filings, you know over time Netflix continues to grow. They're the number one app on the platform. Um, but as a comparison point, when I started at Roku about five years ago, they were roughly fifty percent of the uh, of the streaming, and now they're they're under a third. And and usually they tick down um, over time as other players grow around them. Um, certainly, you've seen new entrants. Um, you know, come on to into the the streaming world um, over the last year or two that have made waves. Uh, most notably, Disney Plus. So that that's diversified some of the the top viewing. Certainly, the Roku didn't the Roku channel didn't exist um, uh, three years ago or roughly three years ago, and so that that's now a top ten app. And like like we said last quarter, was the fastest growing. So so there are there are some new entrants there. They, it does move around. Um, but in general, you know, the ecosystem is is filling out um, as as more companies, you know, uh, shift their focus to streaming. Last question, Steve. This is an easy one for you. The biggest challenge that you focus on in terms of maintaining growth rates o over the next uh, year or two? Well, I think there, uh, there's a couple lenses on that. I mean, I do I do think um, you know externally the biggest opportunity. 
uh, has always been the, the TV ad market and moving these dollars over. And like I said, the viewership is way ahead of that. So the big, the biggest single prize that we can continue to do is, is push on getting these ad budgets, uh, to follow the viewership over to, to OTT and to Roku in particular. Um, and certainly innovations we have around like one, the one view platform, things like the recently announced shop, Kroger shopper data, uh, you know, new performance structures like the incremental audience guarantee. They can all help that, um, but that's certainly the biggest piece. And, and as I mentioned, COVID as a disruptor, uh, I think is, has broken down some of the friction for that. So we'll see see where that goes. But certainly that that's always been our biggest single opportunity. Although there's great growth vectors on international, you know, on building Roku TV share, um, as well as the the Roku channel from both a monetization and an engagement platform, like we talked about. Um, internally, you know, I, I spend a lot of time. Um, you know, worrying about how we how we you know invest in the scalability and the efficiency of the of the operations of the business, um, and so that's something we continue to invest. It's a it's a good problem to have when you're growing you know top line revenue um, as fast as we are, in and building headcount um, is very fast. But obviously, that creates a lot of uh, work internally to keep up and make sure you're scalable. So I spend a lot of time thinking about that as well. Okay. Steve, thank you very much. Steve Loudon, CFO of Roku. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Stay, stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to see you in the new year. And thanks, everybody, for participating this afternoon. Yeah, thank, thanks, for everybody, for joining on the phone. And thanks to Mark and Sweda for hosting. Appreciate it. Stay well, everyone. Bye.